just for the sake of definition, the three prime end processing of RNA is the process of adding adenine nucleotides to the three prime end of the RNA during or after the transcription termination. As we have done before, we will see when and what starts this process, how it is done, and why this three prime end tailing is important. I will sketch out the end stage of termination, where the RNA polymerase has a serine 2 phosphate on the C terminal domain. And this polyase signal is transcribed into the RNA and is bound by proteins like CPSF and CSTF, which recognize the serine 2 phosphate and cleave the RNA. And this is the polyase signal mediated termination. So, to answer this question of when specifically this modification process starts, it is when the polyase signal is recognized and cleavage proteins have bound. This is what we talked about in the transcription termination video. But now I will add some specific details into this cleavage complex that is formed at the polyase signal. So let's zoom into this portion of the RNA. We have seen this polyase sequence, AAU, AAA, just upstream of the signal, we usually have a U-rich sequence. And downstream of this polyase signal, somewhere about 20 or so nucleotides downstream, you will typically find a dinucleotide repeat made up of cytosines and adenines. And even downstream of this dinucleotide repeat region, about 15 nucleotides away, is a GU-rich sequence. And further down towards the 3' prime end, sometimes you can even have a G-rich sequence. Typically, from the start of polyase signal sequence to the end of this GU-rich region is what we usually refer to as the termination and RNA cleavage sequence syntax. Going on forward, I hope you have at least watched the transcription termination video, because the proteins that we are going to discuss here were introduced in that particular video. Okay, so let's add details to this. The poly-A signal stretch is bound by the CPSF. CPSF has some RNA recognition motif. CPSF and the modifications on the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase help in the recruitment of the CSTF protein and CSTF protein binds to this GU-rich region, and CSTF also has RNA recognition motifs. Once these two proteins are bound at these positions, they help and recruit the cleavage factors 1 and 2. Now, if we take a closer look at CPSF, it is actually a multi-subunit protein, which has subunits 100, 73, 30, and the biggest one is called CPSF-160. These numbers are just molecular weights on the proteins in kilodaltons. The first three of these units help in the strength and specificity of CPSF protein in general, and they're the ones that recognize the poly A sequence on the RNA. So essentially they have a binding function. The CPSF160, on the other hand, has the enzymatic activity, which actually performs the cleavage of the RNA. The CPSF has another important function. It recruits the all-essential PAP protein, which stands for poly-A polymerase, which has the job of adding adenines to the cleaved RNA. And sometimes the binding of PAP may also be necessary for transcription termination or cleavage of the RNA. All these proteins, CPSF, CSTF, and cleavage factors are held together via the help of a protein called simplicin which is a scaffold protein, it basically acts like a glue and makes these complex protein interactions a bit more stable. In addition to all of these, sometimes these G-rich and U-rich sequences here can also be bound by some extra or auxiliary proteins. These generally don't have an essential function, but they may sometimes have a regulatory function. So after this complex assembles at the poly-A signal and this GU-rich region, also known as the downstream sequence element, the CPSF-160 with the help of cleavage factors and CSTF make a cut in the CA dinucleotide region. This cut can be anywhere in this region, between cytosine and adenine. And therefore, this region where the cut is made is called the RNA cleavage site. After the RNA is cleaved, it starts the process of 3' end tailing. So now that we understand what and when it starts, let's see how it is done. So after the RNA is cleaved, the cytosine nucleotide is the last nucleotide left, because the cut is made between the cytosine and the adenine. The CPSF is still bound to this AAU-AAA sequence, and the poly-A polymerase remains attached to this bound CPSF. 
The CPSF now stimulates the polymerase activity of the PAP enzyme. The stimulation is driven by a physical contact from the CPSF to the PAP. This sort of physical stimulation is called an allosteric activation. So after activation, the PAP uses ATPs and releases the diphosphate away. The ATP here is of course a ribonucleotide. And the monophosphate adenine is added onto the 3' end of the RNA, right after cytosine. The PAP enzyme adds a lot of these adenines at the end. And this sort of structure at the end of the RNA is called a tail. Here it is a poly A tail. Here's an interesting thing about PAP, if you haven't noticed already. This poly A polymerase is a template independent RNA polymerase, which is very different from RNA polymerase 2, for example, which requires a template DNA to make RNA. The PAP enzyme does not require a template. Okay, so how long can these tails get? If we look at humans or mammals in general, these tails are typically between 200 to 300 nucleotides. In yeast, they're very short, about 70 nucleotides. Now, let's try to understand why in humans the length of poly A tail is around 200 to 300 nucleotides. Alright, so while the PAP is adding adenine to the 3' end of the RNA, a protein called poly A binding protein, PABPN1, the N stands for nuclear, this protein binds to the growing poly A tail. So let's look at the sketch of this process. As soon as the adenine is available, the PAPN1 binds, and one PAP1 protein covers about 11 adenine nucleotides. Now, the poly A binding protein also stimulates poly A polymerase activity, in addition to the stimulation from CPSF. When this happens, the PAP enzyme keeps adding adenines, and the poly A binding protein starts decorating the poly A tail. And this tail grows to be about somewhere between 200 to 300 nucleotides. All these poly A binding proteins provide additional activation to the moving polymerase. The growth of this poly A tail is such that it takes on this circular looping conformation. And somewhere around 250 nucleotides in length, the loop gets too big to be in a circular shape. And the poly A polymerase now has to move away from the CPSF to continue adding adenine at the 3' end of this RNA. Which means that now CPSF cannot physically stimulate the PAP enzyme anymore. So this lack of stimulation at around 250th nucleotide causes the poly A polymerase to slow down. The only source of its stimulation is now the poly A binding protein. But now it's not sufficient to power the polymerase alone. So the polymerase disassembles shortly after losing the contact with CPSF. And this is what controls the length of poly A tails in the mRNA. And that's where this range of 200 to 300 comes from. Alright, so now let's see why this type of 3' end tailing is performed. After the polyadenylation is done, the poly A binding protein remains bound to the poly A tail, and it can actually interact with the splicing proteins and help in the process of splicing. We already know that the 5' cap is bind by the cap binding complexes. And after splicing and tailing, this pre-mRNA matures into an mRNA. And this mature mRNA can take on secondary structures. In this sort of secondary structures, the cap binding complexes at the 5' end can interact with poly A binding proteins. And they further interact with nuclear pore proteins, which export the mature mRNA into the cytoplasm. When the mRNA reaches cytoplasm, the nuclear version of the poly A binding protein is removed, and the poly A tail in the cytoplasm gets decorated with the cytoplasmic version of the poly A binding protein, which is the PABPC1. The 5' end, if you recall from the 5' RNA capping deep dive video, has the cap binding complex, which gets replaced with the eukaryotic translation initiation factor 4E in the cytoplasm. The poly A binding protein, the cytoplasmic version, helps to recruit eukaryotic initiation factor 4G at the 3' end. So you get two translation initiation factors bound, one bound at the 5' end and one at the 3' end. To initiate translation, the two factors come together and help in the recruitment of ribosomes. And this starts the process of translation. So to sum up the advantages of poly A tail, it helps in the export of the RNA, 
and we also saw that it helps in the maturation of the RNA. And since poly A tails are bound by poly A binding proteins in both nucleus and cytoplasm, the poly A tail prevents the mRNA from exonucleus digestion. And we just also discussed that it helps in the process of translation initiation, and it makes the whole process efficient. One thing that we haven't discussed but offers a great advantage to the mRNA is that the poly A tails also help in the regulation of the genes, and they're very important in the quality checks of the RNA. For instance, in certain conditions or signals, you can have hyper or hypopolyadenylation of the RNA. In case of hyper, the length of poly A tail is too long, and in case of hypopolyadenylation, the poly A tails are too short. These hyper and hypopolyadenylated RNAs are usually sequestered away in the nucleus, and they are marked for degradation. So the polyadenylation is sort of a way to ensure that only good quality RNA is exported into the cytoplasm for translation. Before we wrap up, I will leave you with an interesting fact. The histones, or specifically the replication-dependent histone mRNAs, don't have poly A tails. They're the only mRNA that don't get tailed, and their mechanism for transcription termination is also very different from the conventional transcription termination. And that's all for this deep dive video. 